Hello, it's the Fun Ideas Podcast, and today we have a returning guest, except this is the first time he's on video. Um, so with me today is the former editor of Cracked Magazine and a good friend of the late John Severin and the late Steve Ditko and probably a zillion other people. And you can tell me about Neo Charlton and all the other stuff you do. But here he is, Mort Todd. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> or you put in the applause and clapping. <laughs> right, and, right. And hollering. <laughs> Here's the studio. Well, first, <laughs> I, I, I want to raise a drink to my good friend John. It's a uh, it's a glass of Bushmills whiskey, which he introduced me to. He would send me a bottle every Christmas. And before then, you know, I, I just didn't know what I wanted to drink. <laughs> you know, I'd have beer or rum or this or that. But once he sent me the classic Bushmills, I was converted for life. <laughs> it, it's a, uh, it's an Irish whiskey from the oldest distillery in Ireland, mm -hmm. where John's family hails from. And, uh, but what's ironic is that it was a Protestant whiskey and John was a devout Catholic, but... Hmm. Well, Every we'll year, things like that send today. Me, but... <laughs> send me a bottle, and oh boy, it changed my life more than more than perhaps anything. <laughs> so here, here's this, John. This is just water, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I've drunk. But drank, it's Irish water. So, sometimes I've drank and harder stuff on this show, but today <laughs> it's just water. <laughs> <laughs> So I had a request, and this is the whole purpose of doing this show. Uh, Mark, why don't you do a show about the life of John Severin? And I go, mm -hmm, because the people I had contacted back in the day uh, are unfortunately all gone, which was mainly John himself and his wife, Michalina. And so they were the people that I Lovely interviewed, you. which um, I'll promote these right now. Uh, for these two books, if you're cracked, you're happy. Insert applause. <laughs> Which this gentleman to my left uh, actually helped design the covers. You know, he did the back covers too. Um, wow, he's got a UPC. It's legit. Yes. Uh, for uh, everyone who's watching, if you don't have these, uh, you can get them for Bear Manor Media. You can get them from Amazon. And now, even though these aren't, these are soft cover, they're in hardcover for the first time in ever <laughs> they came yeah, out 10 those years books ago are thick there must yeah. be a lot of information in them well there's a whole checklist i mean that's had mixed <laughs> mixed feelings some people say i hate the checklist you should have <laughs> and then other people go cool the checklist well i'm using the checklist for our next collaboration okay. to doing a, a book of and a, you know mark and i have have done a previous collaboration like which I'll like show this those too. Uh, yeah. comedy of John Severn book, you know, Severn and Jack and Davis, Davis book, book. as illustrated. <laughs> and um, I was thinking our next book might be like TV parodies of the 60s and 70s. Sure. And, um, and yeah, we were working on these. These came out. This was a Kickstarter and it did pretty well. Uh, thank you, everyone. And it's still for sale, not the Kickstarter, but I mean, you could still order these from or, or from me or on Amazon. Um, but uh, all the little extra perks and everything in the Kickstarter are long gone. There was hats and postcards and other stuff. I don't I think remember. We still got t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> um, that's true. You can order the t shirts still if you want to, but yeah, that would be a separate purchase. Um, but uh, you and I were talking about doing a follow up, and then this <coughs> pandemic started and it kind of. Through Wait, if you have off. the cough, you got the cough? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm fine. You need to be wearing masks so it doesn't <laughs> go viral. <laughs> I hope this video goes viral. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm fine. I got my first vaccine. I'm ready to do the third, the second one in about oh, there'll two, be a third two weeks. A third virus, yes, <laughs> <laughs> probably will be <laughs> every month. Yeah, anyway, but. Enough about that. So, um, got a request to do a little uh, podcast about the life of John Severin. So, I guess I can start things off by just kind of reading. I printed out what's on Wikipedia, so I'm not. I don't have all this stuff by memory. I mean, I know he's born like <laughs> 1921, but I forgot the day. Turns out it's the so day after Christmas this year. Yes, uh, on in, Christmas. 
December 26, 1921 was his birthday. He always told me it was Christmas. Well, it probably was, but it's, <laughs> I'm not saying Wikipedia is always <laughs> accurate. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it says here he's not he's not dead yet. No. <laughs> oh, um, I wish. Yeah. Um, so a little background on him, and I'll just kind of paraphrase stuff like this. Uh, he... His most distinctive work, besides Cracked, is probably his work for EC Comics. He worked on the war comics, particularly Two Fisted Tales and Frontline Combat. Uh, he worked also on a, the editor. Along yes, with he was Mark. editor of Two Fisted Tales after Kurtzman took over Mad full time, uh, and um, he also worked on a zillion Western comics, which I think you reprinted a few, and you can talk about those. Yes, <laughs> Billy the Kid and Black Bull. And uh, <laughs> and then for Marvel Comics, he did uh, The Incredible Hulk for a while and probably a bunch of other things. Sergeant Fury, Nick didn't he? Fury. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, obviously, yeah, Sergeant yeah. Fury. But and then Fury just, just to get the whole family affair together, his sister Marie Severin was a colorist at DC Comics. She passed away a few years ago as well. And she also oh, and she she worked did, a lot at Marvel. And he, she like, did tons of stuff at Marvel. She worked on she Crazy like, Magazine. Uh, she and she did the Hulk. She did the Hulk too, yeah. Um, let's see. So it says he was born in Jersey City, New Jersey. So someone's got to be. <laughs> And it says here he's of Norwegian and Irish descent, which is almost my background makeup. I'm part Norwegian. You look a lot like him. <laughs> Probably now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I used to have hair, but that's so did John. Now, um, my first question to you to get you in on the conversation. So I've seen photos of Severin, or at least I've heard about it because I'm also doing a mad book right now. Of Severin knew like all those guys like Elder and Jaffe and what everybody them, yeah. back in high school. And it, do you know more about that? I mean, yeah. Your, well, yeah. after uh, they left high school, they formed a studio. Uh, 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 Severin, Elder, and Kurtzman, along with um, oh, oh, now you got me. Uh, the guy that created oh Gustini that created Lucky Luke, Lukey Luke, as they say in France and shit. <laughs> Well, can I say naughty words like that? You can say naughty words. Okay. So uh, <laughs> they had a studio in Manhattan. And that's where basically through John, they came up with the idea of Mad Magazine. Hmm. Because, uh, you know, I, it, you didn't report it from the wiki, but John had been selling cartoons since he was a teenager to Hobo News which was a weird newspaper that was sold uh, to make money for hobos, like in trains and <laughs> on the street and stuff like that. So John had had a long interest in comedy. So the way he told me, Mad was basically his idea. Yeah. And Kurtzman, uh, you know, brought it up at EC and <laughs> involved Elder and Kurtzman. But uh, Elder, Kurtzman, and Severin, like I said, had a career before that working in the studio. This this book, uh, The Black Bull here, wait, 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 it's over here. Yeah, it's all back. Is, uh, some of their first work. <laughs> I, I think it was John's first regular series. He had done like some crime comics and horror comics with Kirby and other people. But I think Black Bull was the first regular series that John had, uh, and it was from Prize Comics, and it was inked by Elder. And there's one story in this book where it was uh, uh, where Kurtzman had a heavy hand in it, and you can see it. I mean, the first, the very first story was by Dick Briefer, who did the Frankenstein Frank humor and horror comics at Prize. But after that first issue, Severn took it over, and it is very early stuff. You might not think it looks like Severin, but you can see some very heavy Severin, you know, aspects to it. I haven't seen all that stuff. Did he always kind of draw the semi-realistic way they seem to draw? Or oh, yeah. different yeah. styles of people back then? Okay. Well, uh, like I said, he, the early stuff, like some crime and horror stuff, it was, it was pretty loose. And, uh, but every now and then you'd see like, oh, that's, a Severin girl or that's a Severin layout 
-hmm. and uh you know so so you see that he also told me some of his earliest works was doing uh dick tracy covers for harvey and yep. joe simon your good friend uh <laughs> gets credited for a lot of them yeah. and they're so loose because he's trying to follow the chester gould style that it's hard to tell it's severin but every now and then there's a detail like if there's a gun or yeah. some wood or something you go like mm, that kind of looks like severin though i haven't been able to identify any particular issues you know as right being, yeah i think the only thing that's, really severin. that's really identifiable if you're going for harvey is uh those uh, what was it called amazing adventures or I forgot what it was oh those yeah that was like yeah. no it was like you know like 15 20 years later yeah, yeah. but yeah that's definitely you know very obvious to tell it severin and um <laughs> on, on my facebook page i whenever i can find good scans of artwork i'll color them just for fun mm -hmm. and a lot of them are severin and yeah there's one of those alarming adventures and uh, uh other stuff like the fargo kid you know like a western that was never printed i composed the cover with the logo and all this <laughs> and we recolored it because it's just like hanging out with my old pal, Sep, again. Now, did you ever, I know you saw Severin when you did the 30th uh, birthday for Cracked. Uh, what year was that? The 88 or something like that? Indeed. Yeah. Uh, did you ever go out to see him in Colorado or no? Nah, unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had, but uh, yeah, that was just it. It was like uh, back in the day before Zoom. Yeah. Like if you dealt with artists and creators out of the tri-state New York area, uh, you do it on the phone or through the mail and stuff. So I, I very literally talked to Severin almost every day for some time for you know at least five years. And yeah, he, he was quite the mentor. <laughs> and we talk about everything under the sun you know like his old work his new work why he did this why he didn't do that all kinds of fun stuff art techniques mm -hmm. everything it was a ultra education mm -hmm. now, but you yeah said, there was that one time in 88 we were having a 30th anniversary crack party mm -hmm. i wasn't even 30 years old then <laughs> but <laughs> you still are. But, but, well, <laughs> but we had this big party in New York that was like, oh, it was really fun. So John didn't like to fly. So we got him and his wife, Michalina, a, a first class cabin on the train. Oh, cool. Yeah. So they came from Denver to Grand Central Station on a train. And I asked John, I was like, of course, I've seen pictures of him. It was like, how will I recognize you? And he was like, well, I've been told I'm a cross between John Wayne and Orson Welles. And it, it is true. He was a big grizzly bear of a guy, you know, with like full beard, nice hairline, and just like, how, how tall was he? Ooh, he had to be over six feet. How tall are you? I don't even know. It's like I think uh, girlfriends have said I was five nine. Okay, so you're a little short. <laughs> I'm like five ten, five eleven, whatever. On a good day, <laughs> so he towered over me. Okay, okay. And, and again, uh, one thing I got to note too is Michalina, his wife, was just what a gal. Because like <laughs> cartoonists, it, it's a hard life. You got to spend a lot of time isolated. Mm -hmm. so you could crank out all your pages i estimated like in the early 60s john was doing over 100 pages a month mm -hmm. and not including painted covers and all kinds of various freelance so that's like over a page a day which right. is kills me and you need a wife like michalina to traffic all that grief you know <laughs> like the best artists have the best wives who handle all the like, where's the check? Like, mm -hmm. you didn't pay us the total a month amount last month and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And as you know, doing yeah. the book, you had to go through Michalina. Yeah. 
I never right. actually officially talked to John, which some people go, oh, you know, that's too bad. And it's like, well, I don't know what I would say to him because she even said, I know everything. <laughs> he doesn't know anything, you know, it's like, and I go, okay, you know, it's like, because she goes, she was the one who told me, yeah, he was already, and you can confirm or deny, you know, right. whether because you were there, uh, that John was always on salary at Crack Magazine. He wasn't an, you know, a per page person. So he literally could do as much or as little work as he wanted to on Crack. I don't know if that was still the case when you came along, but. No, nah, it was a per page rate. And, okay. and and I, I'll go into more into that in a bit with, okay. you know, Lake and everything. But uh, another thing about Micheline I got to mention is that John's colorblind. Yeah. And, and he did all these painted covers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like Michalina had to label all the paint colors for him yeah, that, so yeah. that like it still slipped through because every now and then you get a f green flame on a birthday cake or. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm sure Michalina never saw E.T., so yeah, the green ETs, she didn't know E.T. Yeah. wasn't green. They're aliens, right? Yes. <laughs> right. And uh, maybe even John thought, oh, it says green on here. Aliens are green. I'll, I'll use that. And it's you like, take it, it for granted, green. right? Uh, who knows? Yeah. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, so going back uh, now, it, if I went a little further on here, since you mentioned it already, it's like, uh, while attending high school, he contributed cartoons to the Hobo News. So it, it is uh, now on you're here. using Wiki. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, have you seen any of these Hobo News car comics or anything like that? I, I did a real long time ago, and they were sort of, uh, you know, in the style of like F. Hopper in the 20s and 30s. They were hmm. kind of like loose and jiggly type drawings. Yeah. Can you still tell it's John's work or is it kind of like, because no. like Jack Davis, for example, you know, you see stuff he did like in his high school yearbook and in the Navy. And it, it kind of looks like Jack Davis. But if you didn't know it was Jack can't Davis, you probably yeah. wouldn't think it was Jack Davis. At least no, I can't help it. Yeah. You know, it's just no, as he I got mean, older, sure you get that style. Yeah, it was like I was saying with the uh, Dick Tracy covers. Like, there's yeah. got to be a giveaway. There's got to be a clue somewhere. It was like, that's yeah. a Severn Rock in the background, yeah. right? Something. And it yeah. wouldn't have to be that way. See, the thing about Harvey stuff, first of all, because they never credited everything, and I'm the one who wrote the Harvey Comics Companion. I get it wrong, sorry, folks, but it's like <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, even if severin say ain't, it, penciled it it doesn't necessarily mean he inked it and it didn't mean he painted it necessarily he probably did in the case of the dick tracy covers but i mean you don't know all that because they don't put that like marvel did in the 60s it was like inked by fantastic uh fred smith and <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> you know uh letters by jolton joe dimaggio whatever you know they didn't do that on anyone i think ec probably was the first one that gave severin a credit correct uh it, well it's hard to say i mean sometimes uh artists would sneak a signature in, you know right but i mean where they actually proudly let him put severin or jay severin and you know they even had the little bios and stuff like that yeah but, but i don't think they actually had credit boxes like marvel did you know right right but you know the thing that also is good about ec versus other studios is that they allowed people to draw in their own style. Um, whereas like using Harvey as an example, um, especially later when they're doing the cast of Richie Rich stuff, they wanted everybody to draw on the Steve Mufati or later the Warren Kremer style. And right. to this day, it, it, it like Ernie Cologne drew so closely to Warren Kremer that people commonly say, well, that's a Cologne cover. And I have to say, no, it wasn't right. because Cologne rarely did cover it. No, so, yeah, and but it, it's because I know all this history that right. I've researched over the years. And it's the same thing with those Dick Tracy covers. It's like, um, originally I just thought it was Chester Gould because, hey, it's Dick Tracy. And then- And it's got a signature. It yeah. says Chester Gould right <laughs> yeah. over there. And it was in talking to Sid Jacobson. No, no, no. Most of the covers weren't done by the comic artists. They were actually done by, you know, and he'd label them off and he'd say, he didn't mention John Severin, but I'm not saying that he didn't do them. I think Severin did do some of those. I think this would have been the late 40s. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Simon was a lifelong friend with Albert Harvey. So he definitely did a lot of stuff. Everybody thinks, well, oh, he gets credited for a lot of them. Yeah. 
Joe Simon, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I mean, they, people don't even know Joe Simon was even around Harvey, and it's like all they think of is Captain America, and it's like, no, no, he was right. with them in the seventies and eighties doing paperback covers with. I think there's probably things. like Al A Vision or whatever yes. did a lot that Simon gets yeah, credit. That was one too, and uh, and then of course Kremer did a lot, a lot of covers, and then um, beautiful. Uh, then the, like the beautiful. horror stuff. Uh, Lee Elias gets credit for things where he just did the finishes. Uh, he didn't do the original uh, artwork, but my Kremer sure. book is coming out. And conversely, <laughs> where he had other anchors like John right. Belfi and stuff like that. Yeah, so it makes it confusing because it's this like, is for geeks only. Yes. <laughs> 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 so question about john um uh when he did his stuff at any point in his career did he tend to ink his own stuff and pencil his own stuff and do everything himself or did he have assistance well <clears throat> initially like him and elder worked a lot together mm -hmm. and uh so a lot of times early john stuff was inked by El bill elder will elder bill bill Will, and uh but then later he was always inking penciling and inking his own work and i asked him about, about that because uh you know i was like well with a lot of artists how come you don't just pencil and let other people ink there are some instances where like uh there was like a story in creepy i think that wally wood inked one of john's stories and um you know very rarely and John would tend to ink other artists more than anyone would ink his pencils. And I asked him about that and he was like, well, the way I draw, I barely pencil mm -hmm. and I do all the finish work in the inks. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> not to equate myself with such talent, I do the same thing. But uh, so he said for him to actually pencil a story mm -hmm. is so much work that he might as well ink it, mm. you know? So why bother it? So, you know, and I can understand that because like uh, his pencils were probably pretty non-existent. They were probably so loose and he knew what he wanted and just could ink it, you know, tight as we all love his work. You know? Now, now when he came out, uh, is the 30th anniversary party the only time you met him or did you see him a couple more times? No, that know? was it. I, oh, I okay. still continue to work with him for like another 15 years or so. Right, but right. It was all through um, phone and mail. Because I was just wondering if you watched him draw um, um, no, it or pencil anything yeah. like that. If you, yeah. um, So speculation i guess i mean do you think what he did was just like block out like and just put general forms and then he yeah. took the pen and just okay yeah because like i said not to equate myself with him but yeah i i do okay. super loose mm -hmm. breakdowns and then all all the real drawing is in inking and mm -hmm. i'm sure he was the same way because it's like you know what you want you just want to block it out like a a director would do in a film or play just know this guy's here that background's here and then you know it saves a lot of grief right. like than doing like completely full tight pencils for your own inks i mean i know some artists that do that and i'm like why <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to me is you know i'm no professional artist but it's like when i've drawn cartoons and comics I hate drawing it a second time. I just like, and that, and that, and that was one of the reasons, right? That yeah. was one of the reasons why yeah. I, I said, let the real artist do things. I can at least yeah. plan it out and do a quick sketch for somebody saying, this yeah. is what I want, you know, this here and that here and that here. And then I right. hand it to like you and then you make it look like this, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know. Now, in the case of this, this is a, an actual Severin drawing that was unpublished. It's one of the last drawings, if not the last drawing by Severin, who did uh, Sylvester there. So that's unique to this book, if anybody wants to know. Um, Can I color it? And, and more colored <laughs> it, yeah, because it's a black and white drawing. It was like, yay big, if you can stretch wow. the screen. Do you have the original? I do not. A friend of mine does. He probably doesn't want me to mention his name, but um, he found out I was doing the crack book, and he told me about it. And I go, ooh, because um when i talked to michalina and john john was in the middle of doing a later version of um batlash 
And I think DC made a graphic novel out of it. I think it was a six issue miniseries or something, but he was feverishly trying to get the deadline done. And I go, wow, he's still working incredibly, oh, incre- worked, incredible yeah, hours. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, because this is like 2009 we're talking about. No, he, he did like his last work was for Dark Horse. Yeah. And it was, you know, the day he died, basically. Yeah. And uh, so that's what he was working on when I tried to interview him. And then this book came out in 2011. It wasn't Rawhide um, Kid? No, it was It was actually Batlash. It was, yeah. it was the DC book that he put out. You know, the Because uh, do you remember his Rawhide Kid for Marvel? Yeah, yeah. But this is later kinda, than that. I was yeah. kind of surprised because... Uh, I have Marvel, it, but I don't have it with me. But Yeah, yeah well, John was a little conservative, perhaps, you might say. Yes, but uh, Rawhide Kid was like uh, rewritten as a gay Western character. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't see that but, version. <laughs> yeah, and this so was normal like, in the the earliest the, the OOs, as it were, the first uh, decade of this century. Is is that what you're talking about? That they had him come out, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I I, I never read it either, so I don't know. Oh, okay. How oh, okay. Uh, but I mean, they, the time, the win. timeline of when this was, what year was? Oh it? yeah, 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 yeah. So this was yeah. like, yeah, it, it probably like, like two thousand three, five. Yeah, I don't mean the timeline for <laughs> the original character. Uh, Eighteen sixty. Eighteen seventy five. Yeah. When so, when Rawhide Kid tried to pick up the old prospector. <laughs> so this is probably probably because of Brokeback Mountain and everything being oh. popular. Is, yeah. That's probably uh, why they did like this. An, or... an early example of Marvel getting woke. Okay. <laughs> so, so you said Severin was conservative. So how did he handle it? Did he just kind of draw and hold his well, nose? No, no, or was no. he very no, critical I, I, of that? No, I'm, what I'm saying is like he's considered, uh, you know, very conservative and everything. But like, oh, okay. I don't think he had a problem with it whatsoever. You know, it was just like, oh, okay, all right. I was well, just saying, I don't, do, I don't want to draw that. <laughs> right? No, no, no. Because no. <laughs> it seems like it was just like you know, folks is folks. It seems like and John was pretty folks. open to drawing almost anything. I mean, considering all the work he did at Cracked all those oh, yeah. years, you know, so. I mean, he may not agree with it, but, you know, I, I think, you know, he, he took some of the things as a challenge. Um, yeah. One well, of the things it's not like to... Ditko. Ditko had actually turned down jobs for certain reasons because he disagreed with them and stuff. And I'm, I'm going to announce something here no one has ever heard of before, is that the fact that uh, DC approached uh, Ditko to do that, the comic Firestorm. Mm, yeah you know that character yeah and uh he turned it down because the cops weren't portrayed as good people in the story wow yeah <laughs> hmm. so i, I mean you know D- i know D- we're going D- on a tangent about ditko but it was right. ditko i know he liked the on run stuff and things like that but was he generally a conservative guy or what was his kind of yeah political background well, like, uh, you know, I said, uh, I would, I would talk to John several hours a day and uh, on the phone, but Ditko would come into the office several hours a week mm-hmm. and we'd talk about everything. And, um, uh, yeah, Ditko was actually a student of Ayn Rand at the Empire State Building. She had mm-hmm. classes in the sixties and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, John and Steve were big mentors for me because I was like 23 years old loved their work and <laughs> it was just such an honor to like hang out with them both several many hours a week and just mm-hmm. talk about everything you mm-hmm. know movies yeah. tv shows comics their careers all that stuff so did Ditko important. and Severin know each other or no well I'll tell you okay I mean, uh, Ditko is a very big fan of of John's work. He'd come into my office and he'd look at John's artwork and just like hold it up and he'd run a finger over all the artwork to look (laughs) at the detail and texture and all this stuff. And, you know, what I've mentioned in the past is that uh, when I was at Marvel, I got the rights to do Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand Mm -hmm. and my big plan was to have Ditko pencil it and Severin ink it. Oh, wow. Yeah, because like a lot of the story is about trains. 
Mm -hmm. you know and i figured between the two of them you know uh john would put every friggin bolt on that train <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the problem was like I got the rights and I told Steve and Steve was like, I don't want to be responsible for drawing how these characters look and everything. And I'm like, he's like, Ev every person who reads the book has their own the idea of how the characters look. Right. And I told that to the Ayn Rand estate and they were like, whatever Steve does will approve yeah because <laughs> you know they knew steve's attachment to objectivism and stuff so but unfortunately steve didn't go for it and i think if steve and john had done that book you know it'd be an evergreen it would right. still be selling today because i think atlas shrugged is like you know two or three below the bible in sales <laughs> like after kiss me deadly by mickey spleen <laughs> i think Cat it's in still in the top three and stuff but like um did uh it, so the project just died after that yeah he didn't continue but, but john did ink ditko oh. for yeah for an issue of what the oh i remember that yeah yeah <laughs> okay which so was, they did work together i guess which, that's kind of interesting which um, was like a, a marvel humor magazine and so i knew john i knew steve had been drawing it and that john was thinking it and i asked john about it and he was like i have no idea what was going on in that story i just inked it <laughs> now, did, it they, like, did they ever meet did they meet at that 30th no. birthday okay no i okay. certainly invited steve yeah. to the parties and, and stuff. i i don't think they didn't work at marvel at the same time right uh, early sorry. on they didn't work at marvel at the same oh, yeah, time yeah, in yeah. the 60s no it's atlas you know before marvel okay. at, at, when okay. they were called atlas and oh, okay that's right i mean so they, they even appeared in the same magazine with strange tales when uh with Doctor Strange and and Nick Fury, Agent of Shield. Now, now would they have been both together in New York at the 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 proverbial bullpen, or was John long well, ago gone to Colorado? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, John lived in New Jersey until the seventies. Oh, okay. And so, then so. moved to Colorado, but uh, John also worked in the bullpen at the Empire State Building uh in the 50s uh with him and joe manili and a bunch of other artists had uh the, the bullpen was on the fifth floor editorial was like on the 33rd floor and like i said john didn't like to fly and he didn't like heights so he was very glad to just be on the fifth floor <laughs> so i would imagine Steve might have dropped by. So they might have met once or twice, yeah. but nothing consistent. Okay. Right. right. Not nothing. Because I, you know, I never think about right. these things. That's why I was like thinking, did they work? And then you said Atlas. Of course there's an Atlas, but yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> so um, I mean they probably worked on stuff together, but uh whether they I'm sure they met, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't like let's pal around together every day yeah. because you know it's like they had their yeah. own lives, but um and again the, to, you know contrary to steve's reputation he he liked to party mm. he like in the charlton days he would go out to derby connecticut a lot and go bowling and play baseball and do stuff with other charlton people out there but he didn't come that. to the thir the crack 30th was it just because he had certain uh Fear of people at certain times, or is Let's it just say reservations? I don't know. Okay, because it was wild. Because when we had the party, all the you know comic artists, uh, glitterati showed up. You know, like right. Joe Kubert, like Ramitas, everyone showed up because John was so rarely in New York. They just right. wanted to. And you invited anybody that was somebody. I mean, not everybody. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, if, if somebody called up and if it was like even Stan Lee, if he says, "Can I come?" You wouldn't have right. turned away. You never yeah. worked at Cracked. You worked at Crazy. Go away. Right. No. No, <laughs> and <coast>. Snafu. <laughs> yeah. No, and also yeah. Don yeah. Martin was at the party too. Yeah. So. We even got mad people who showed Ooh, up. Mad people. That's, I have heard that before. <laughs> That's true. 
Um, so that's the question I had based on some of the stuff we were talking about before we went live here, um, because some things can't make it on the show. Um, we were talking about severance conservatism, uh, and we're talking about whether uh, he get along with like Ditko and stuff like that. So there's a few people I'm kind of curious about because I'm working on a mad book and something is up to my own speculation. Some is like based on just little things I've read. Um, you talk to Severn regularly, and I was just curious um, if you know this or learn this. So Severn was on the in the first 10 issues of Mad when it was a comic book, and uh, then suddenly he was gone. Now, I always contend the reason why he left is because he got the opportunity to edit Two-Fisted Tales, and he's, it, that was like more interesting, lucrative gig for him. And he figured, well, Wood, Davis, and Nelder, they can take care of that with Kurtzman, and I'll do my own thing. But I've also read that he and Kurtzman didn't get along. So do you know anything about this and what is probably more close to the truth? Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, you want more? No. That's it? <laughs> That's usually what I read. So did they not get along? I thought they did get along. No, they, they had a falling out. They were okay. they were pals. And like I said, they had a studio okay. and all this stuff. I think there might have been a little resentment about Mad because, uh, you know, from John's perspective, he came up with the idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Kurtzman took it over. And he might have might have i mean this speculation might have resented having to follow his layouts except i found that not to be the case mm -hmm. actually because i i've done layouts for john before and he loves it because it, it, yeah. it's really a springboard for him to either follow or ignore yeah and i was but, gonna ask you about that because you yeah know, he but with kurtzman he might have been like you got to follow this completely. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and so uh, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I wasn't Kurtzman editing two fisted tales before or was it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was never Feldstein. Yeah. No. Okay. Was, so yeah. I think like uh, mad took over Kurtzman so much right. that he gave up two fisted tales yeah. and Severin jumped at it for the reasons you mentioned just because of the historical aspects and the fun and said like bye bye to so he, he he was not necessarily offered it it was just available or do you know that history nah, it, I, I don't okay. know i probably have to ask but, tommy burns or somebody I, else I, who knows this stuff backwards and forwards who would know <laughs> tommy burns big ec yeah. fanatic you know he's been on this show no i years. just think yeah it became available because kurtzman wanted to uh you know, to focus more on MAD and yeah. maybe there was some inter-office talk where it right. was like, you know, if this slot's open, I want, you know, John wanted to get the hell out of MAD and yeah. this was more appropriate for him. Okay. Because um, it's hard to oh, tell let me sometimes. Just add one more thing too about uh, John's work at EC. Because uh, I, I asked John, like, why didn't you do more horror stories, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, like, the main horror story he did was, like, Strop Before You Kill Me or something about a fireman's revenge or whatever that Elder Inked and stuff. Right, like, right. You know, uh, it's so obvious. Why didn't you do more horror? Because, you know, there was the um, the Warren stuff that he did that is so, such great horror. Not to mention Monsters Attack. Right. It's great horror. I can show this to you. Are you talking? <laughs> right on, Daddy. <laughs> I got it too. Hey. <laughs> but uh, I hope you so I asked him why didn't more EC horror, and he he said um, that uh, Gaines asked him to, and uh, so John did a, a drawing of an anatomically correct severed foot. <laughs> And it just, you know, grossed out gain so much. He was like, okay, 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 don't do horror. <laughs> well, I even, um, I don't know if I can find it while we're talking here. I might be able to. But I mean, this used to freak me out as a kid. Um, you know, it's so, you know, I was a squeamish little kid. No, <laughs> when I started reading Cracked, you know, you know, Cracked loved prior to you to do parodies of MASH. 
And so mm-hmm. they, they did, I think, I believe, eight parodies over the years. Because, Usually. Uh, you know, and, uh, and that's just straight, that's just straight parody, not counting articles that might be about MASH or right. something else like that. Or iron on. Um, I can't seem to find it here easily, but... Um, but in the version. first parody of Cracked, which is like the, one of the earliest issues I ever saw, I don't even think I bought the issue because it just grossed me out. <laughs> is um, uh, so anybody looking at it, look up the first time uh, Cracked uh, parodied Mash, which I believe is from 1974, and they're all all the doctors are like uh, doing surgery, and then one of them just holds up this guy's arm and it's detached. And it's not even that disgusting, but as a little kid, I was like, oh, <laughs> because it looked realistic. It didn't look yeah. cartoony, you know. And I was well, like, even, oh, even on this cover, like yeah. there's like a <laughs> there's like a little severed hand and eyeball with some bones on it. Right, and right. Like, well, by the time you did your thing with the uh, monsters uh, attack and everything, you know, I was a teenager going into adult so i was eating up monster stuff i was reading <laughs> famous monsters and everything else but at the time i was like oh, you know well anyone that? listening to there's uh or watching there's like two or three severance stories per volume and these things and pinups he did and other stuff and you know i i was in a privileged position as the editor of these books so I wrote most of the stories John drew and, you know, I, I tried to make them heavy, you know, and worthwhile for the talent that was drawing them and stuff. There's, you know, like there's a story about the golem, Mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, reflects actual, you know, German history. Mm -hmm. There's like, uh, the little vampire boy that ties into the, polio epidemic of the 50s which wow it just mm. it just means so much today mm. <laughs> I, I, I found the thing i mean um there we go i don't know if you can see it here there it is the the severed hand oh the yuck <laughs> and that freaked me out as a little kid i was like right. seven years old i was like that's yeah. like an ad from Horror House. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like I said, I was a squeamish little kid, but, you know, I grew out of that. But, you know, uh, I couldn't even look at famous monsters. I'd see it on the stand. I'd go, oh, put that back. And then uh-huh. three years later, it's like, I can't get enough of this stuff. You know, so it's a, so by the time you did Monsters Attack, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of always you were near to it. I, I was always disappointed that it only lasted five issues. And then oh, tell me did, about you, it. You only did four of them, and I never saw the fifth one. I didn't even know a fifth one came well, out. Well, I commissioned years over later, half so. of the fifth yeah. issue as well. Yeah, but I never saw it on the stands. I, I got years later in the eBay yeah. days. But anyway, so. Well, um, they decided to take a different direction <laughs> for the fifth issue because, you know, I, I, I hired uh, Jerry DeFuccio and uh, Lou Silverstone from MAD to take over cracked when i left and they took over monsters attack and they didn't give a a a toss about <laughs> horror comics so the stuff they commissioned was more like crime comics and you know there's a couple stories i had already commissioned that were in the bin um and plus there's a john severin story in the second volume of the Monsters Attack collection that was never published. That's it's a World War I dog fight between a French werewolf and a German vampire. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Is it this it? Uh, Transformation Flying? Exactly. Okay. So. It, it was like written by a good friend of mine who's a big history buff and put a lot of work into it. He did he did rough layouts for it too. And again, like like I said, Severin would like either follow it or use it as a springboard Mm -hmm. there's one frame in this that i like uh just this one here where it's like (laughs) (laughs) anyway the thing thing with severin like with the golem story that i did in this one Mm -hmm. he uh well i'd send him reference for uh old german films like nosferatu or the golem film so they make they make cameos in this a la severine 
<laughs> right. Now, the question I have, and this is related to what I was talking about earlier, but you you said, so his stuff's too gruesome. And Bill said, no, stick with Mad, stick with Two Fisted <laughs> Tales. Um, I'm under the impression uh, that Severn didn't get along with Kurtzman after the falling out, but he didn't ever get along with Al Feldstein. Is that correct? That's what I heard, too. Yeah. yeah. And I don't and, know what the reason for that was. Uh, probably because of editorial dictates. <laughs> because it seems like, in a certain respect, people had like a love-hate relationship with Al Feldstein. I mean, he gave you free reign to do a lot of stuff your own way, but within the confines of all that text. So you had to, and Craigstein, Bernie Craigstein is one example where he's like, I can't stand right. this and he'd move it around and you know Feldstein be like why you and all this stuff but they seem to work together whereas uh Severin and uh Feldstein like you'd think that Severin could have been plucked off for one of the panic stories or something like that because you know but he got Orlando instead you know using yeah. that as an example so well many many times over the years after <clears throat> John had left mad they approached him about returning mm -hmm. and the thing was is like they offered an okay page rate but because uh you know mad had so many artists per issue they could only guarantee you know maybe four six eight pages a month yeah. whereas john at cracked yeah. sometimes did two-thirds of the book yeah well you know so even with a lower page rate you know john would make a lot more money working at cracked than at mad right. and you know, and Felstein might have been an aspect as well. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they did manage to get Jack Davis back, but then Davis seemed to be a likable fellow that always seemed to get along with most everyone, even if he didn't like the work. Because I know when I talked to Jack Davis uh, that uh, I asked him about working at Cracked, and the one thing he could say is, oh, they paid terribly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he didn't dislike the work. He just didn't like that it was paid so low and you know right. you, you saw that after you know everybody saw that after he left cracked and sick he didn't do humor stuff for about three years until they got him back at mad and he was yeah. doing record albums and a tv guy well, and time magazine you, and stuff the best pay. thing <laughs> you know? the best thing that ever happened to jack davis is that he got blackballed from mad yeah. a lot of artists and kurtzman took a lot of artists away from mad to work for like humbug trump you know right other humor magazines and they were blackballed from working yeah. they ended up taking back jaffe uh you know a few other artists but i think it was the best thing to happen for davis because that's just it he had to live he had to freelance mm -hmm. and and that's when he started getting tv guide covers uh you know newsweek time movie posters record albums and got paid actual money as opposed to like <laughs> more drucker who you know like stayed at mad and and mad wouldn't allow them for the most part to work anywhere else mm -hmm. even though they weren't under contract didn't have, get health care whatever mm -hmm. you know it was by some fluke that george lucas managed to get more drucker to do american graffiti poster and stuff right, you know right. Like yeah. Don Martin couldn't get advertising work. Like advertising companies would call Mad and want to use these artists, <laughs> and Mad wouldn't give them contact information. Right. So yeah. the best yeah. thing that happened to Jack Davis is that he got blackballed from Mad <laughs> and became a millionaire cartoonist. And then Mad was like, "Oh, you can come back, Jack. It's all right <laughs> for you to come back." Yeah. You know. So. At least he was nice and came back because he worked there for like another 30 years or yeah. something after that. So, um, well, in the 80s, too, I did an all Jack Davis issue of his oh yeah. crack work. Which was the basis for this. <laughs> Rather. Uh, so I called him about doing a new cover and all this stuff. And he was like, oh, I, I oh, well, I, I couldn't do that to Bill and all this stuff. And all that. Yeah, you could. Cool. But like, <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't didn't you ultimately he designed a postage stamp for the uh, postal service, and that was what you you did, we didn't end up putting that in the book, but I mean, no, it, we did that on the back cover. 
Yeah, and, that was like the compromise or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He gave me the contact information for the postal service and stuff. So it was new Jack Davis art, but right. right. <laughs> but it's almost he's like a sweetheart. Uh, he was I, just such a sweetheart. Him I know Mark we're going Robert off on a Davis too, tangent, just, but I mean that's kind of like with Sick Magazine. After Davis left Sick Magazine, uh, Joe Joe Simon would reprint uh, Davis's Christmas cards for a couple of years until Davis said, "Would you stop reprinting my Christmas cards?" <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why the last few things he did for Sick are just Santa drawings, you know, right. with these kind of dumpy, skinny, frumpy Santa Clauses. It was supposed to be just a personal greeting card, right? For, you know, and suddenly it's in Sick Magazine. It's like, stop. Damn. Anyway. Were, were Joe Simon and Paul Lakin cousins? Or something? I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know they have similarities on things that yeah. they did, but... That, but I'll tell you, know, you too, with Mort Drucker, yeah. Yeah. you know, because we, we've gotten Don Martin. Right. You know, I simply called him up and said, we'll give you the same page rate return your original art which mad didn't do mm -hmm. and uh you own your copyright which mad didn't do so yeah. like don was like the zoom yeah. came to crack i offered the same thing to uh mort drucker yeah and Mort, uh, super sweetheart right but he was like well you know i needed uh some heart surgery a few years ago and Bill gave me a Bill Gaines gave me a loan because mm -hmm. like you know they didn't have health insurance or reprint money or anything mm -hmm. or own the original art so Bill gave him a loan that he had to pay back right so he felt obligated to stay at mad and mm -hmm. stuff like that and then you know after everyone's done and gone you know it's like Bill's selling all the original art and you know making millions off it and stuff whereas like drucker still owes him for his for his heart surgery <laughs> he probably still owes him. no that's terrible yeah anyway donning his grandchildren <laughs> it's, it's a little mailbox Gaines has a little mailbox at his grave <laughs> insert check here <laughs> All right, we're making fun of the dead. Oh well, it's not libel, so or slander because you can't. Oh, anyway. one other anecdote I got to tell yes. you too is um, uh, this company Paper Cuts got yep. the rights for Tales from the Crypt, mm -hmm. and we're doing new Tales from the Crypt stories. And I wrote and drew a few of them and stuff. And uh, I got a I got a letter from his. So it was his daughter or his wife, Bill Gaines' daughter or his wife, that said, oh, I wish Bill could have seen your art. He would have loved it so much. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Bill hated me. <laughs> you don't know the skateboard story? Right. <laughs> anyway, if you want to know the skateboard story, you have to get one of these books here. Right. Volume two. So, Because we're supposed to be talking about John Severin. Anyway, <laughs> get you back on track. Um, one thing, though, you know, you got all these people from Mad, but actually when you started it, correct, Severin wasn't even there. Is that correct? Unfortunately yeah. so. Yeah, because uh, didn't they, when Sproul sold it, he just sold the magazine. He didn't really sell... The staff, the artist. so everybody yeah, was didn't own the artist. Yeah. So when you got in there, I mean, I know it was Lakin, but you didn't even see Lakin because he worked out of his house. So I mean, what did you now, see? He'd come what... in once a week. To oh, office. okay. So he did come in occasionally. Okay. So what did you see when you came to work? I mean, it's like, did you have any say so at the beginning? I know you did later on. Well, basically, I mean... uh, yeah, they had hired Paul Lakin, who had worked on humor magazines for decades. Mm -hmm. So. uh you know, uh, the original publisher, Bob Sproul, had sold it's Bob, right? Not Bill, yeah, yeah Bob Sproul's the son, yeah, and <laughs> Bill's still with us. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> he had sold the magazine in 84 85 to this, um, this advertising company in New York, they were based in Florida, and uh, so they got lake and based on his uh experience yeah. with humor magazines over the last few decades to package the books yeah and you know they gave him like a sum 
and he paid off the artists and all that stuff. And uh, th after one or two issues, they realized, you know, it wasn't a good bet because like he was doing like Nixon jokes in the right. 80s and, you know, didn't really have a, a firm grip on the youth market. So they were looking for an assistant editor that would also be in house, you know, in their offices, as opposed to him just coming in once a week to try and attract the youth market. Mm -hmm. And seeing how I was basically 10 years older than the target audience, you know, after some finagling, I got <laughs> hired. And uh, the first thing I told them is like, without Severin, this magazine is dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, L Lakin had done tons of human magazines, you know, beyond sick or crazy or cracked right. that had all died because there wasn't an overwhelming talent like Severin. And plus, Severin was cracked and cracked with Severin. Right. And, and so I basically told these publishers, without Severin, your magazine's going to die. It's not going to last too long. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, your first job is to get Severin. And so <laughs> was through some friends at Marvel, I called up Severin and was like, dude, we need you. <laughs> and he was like, well, I heard from Lakin. And Lakin had offered an insulting page rate and <laughs> wanted a kickback. <laughs> you know, which is just like crazy. So I basically said, um, you know, he was a little suspicious of me because I was working at Cracked, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, what kind of page rate you want? And, you know, what terms and we'll make it happen. And he was like, well, okay. He wanted 500 a page, which is still a pretty good page rate for comics. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, and he also said, I want to make sure I don't answer to anyone but you to me, you know. So I was like, all right, well, I talked to the publishers. They were like, all right, let's do it. And, <laughs> and, and he was getting 1500 for covers. Yeah, which was nice. And uh, so at that moment, I basically became half editor of the magazine right. and I packaged about half of the book and Lakin did the other half but then going through the artwork and all this stuff I realized and talking with other artists that he was using I realized that like he was reusing pages from sick magazine <laughs> and other other comics and selling them to cracked which you know could be a potential lawsuit and then talking to other artists, I realized he was getting kickbacks from everybody yeah. and, and with crummy rates and everything. So, mm -hmm. so basically when I found that out, you know, they wanted a new editor and did an editor search. And over the months they tried to find a new editor, I was secretly packaging the book <laughs> <laughs> and and sent them to press and everything until they ultimately realized and like mm, I guess you can do these books and I was like yeah I can do these books yeah <laughs> and John so, of, of course was the superstar of Cracked again yeah so I guess you know you hit it off immediately right you did you, you know you and John yeah <laughs> Well, with all artists I work with, I mean, it was it was because of like I respected him so much. Yeah. I knew most of these artists work so well that you know I, I could speak their language not only as you know boy editor behind the desk, but as a fanboy and also a a, a, a developing creator. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I could speak to him on a lot of levels. And, you know, I think a lot of it boiled down to being just a fanboy and loving whenever I got their work and I'd be like, oh, this is so cool. I see what you did here and this is great. And, blah, 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 blah. and I really think we got better work from John than he'd been doing for Crack for years. Yeah. You know, because I think it was our interaction and 
you know, and stuff like that, where we, where John found a moment to shine again, instead of doing the Fonzie parody for the 15th time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of people. There's this um, interview in comics journal back in like 1983 or so, 82, I think somewhere around there. And he talks at length about his work for EC and for prize and for this company and that company. And other than the brief one sentence intro that mentions cracked, it didn't mention anything else. And I was like looking at it going, he's worked for this longer than anything else. And they don't right. talk about it. I mean, yeah, I'd at least ask he's about been it. been there he, about a quarter of a century by then. Yeah. yeah I mean, really I, I think you can really see um, phases of John's interest in cracked. Mm -hmm. I think in the early books, he went overboard. There's some beautiful stuff. Yeah. You know, and then I think by the early 70s, it was just work. Yeah. They would send him a script and like, you know, draw Star Wars, draw Fonzie. Yeah. You know, well, sometimes they didn't do it very well. Like, um, I remember when they did parodies of Mork and Mindy, um, there was like an old lady on the show. I forgot the, how the character was, like an ant or something. And he could draw Robin Williams perfectly uh pam dauber pretty good and the dad <laughs> not so much and then the grandmother conrad chanis like anybody you know it's like did he not have reference or did he just not care you know well and, no well i mean that's a good point because like back then i mean it was like you didn't have the the web for oh, reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true you could only <laughs> use like tv guide or people magazine if you were like lucky and stuff and and that's one thing i did at crack too is try to get as much freaking reference as possible yeah like with the batman movies and stuff like that i'd get all the you know photo books and magazines and star log whatever mm -hmm. try to get as much you know coverage as possible right. you know for him to do the parodies as uh, along with going to the movie set <laughs> right i remember you said that uh, wasn't that in england was you know, Pinewood yeah. 007 <laughs> set. Right. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, um, I snuck in there and took photos and like we beat Mad, who was owned by the film company right. Warner Brothers, <laughs> with the parody with like you know the Batmobile looking like it was supposed to and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I still um you know, I, I, I think Mad still at that point, not later, because after that, I think when you scooped it, it kind of helped change things is they have this kind of attitude of letting like basically the fad died down before they even bothered to do a parody just to make sure well, well if we do a parody numbers, well people remember would, this you know yeah, or something like they that. would look at box office and yeah. this and that as opposed to like what would what would your audience be interested in yeah because you know, I know I like crack did pretty well, except for Leonard part six. Right. I mean, crack was pretty good about putting popular stuff back then. But uh, the one that always makes me laugh is in the 70s, uh, they did a parody of Capone, which John drew. Uh, and it's Beautiful like, cover. Who, who, who's, ben, her, ben who's her of Capone? You know, and, uh, you know, I've talked, we mentioned Billy Sproul. I talked to him about that. It's like, why in the world did you do a cover story about a movie that was such a flop? And he goes, well, we thought I'd be the new Godfather, and you know my dad liked it. You know, it was okay. You know, it's like didn't really work out that yeah, way. Yeah, you get you a know. hit and miss every now and then. Yeah, and again, that's another reason for like if you look at my covers uh, as opposed to the earlier covers, I, I do all the layouts for covers, and I try and pack as many freaking celebrities as possible. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you don't like Stallone. Well, there's RoboCop, or you know, like, even, even uh, uh, Sproul would do that in the old days, you know, because you know, especially on the annuals, you'd have like king size right. cracked, and it'd oh, have, like, man. every 60s celebrity you could hear of, you know, on the cover. It'd have Tiny oh. Tim and Twiggy, and you know, Rowan and Martin, from and Uncle, blah, blah, blah. yeah, everybody, exactly. yeah. And, oh, and and they only those covers on. only appeared on there. I mean uh since you had to tell Severn, did he enjoy doing all that type of stuff that little intricate detail work or did you just do it he just he never complained yeah never. it was his bag you know okay i mean uh there i did a we did a, a crack subscription ad once 
that had, you know, probably like 70 people in it and stuff. And <laughs> he got them all spot on. Yeah. Well, even your monster's attack cover, the one to your uh, right shoulder, you know, with all the, yeah, that one, uh, you know, there's a lot of characters on there, you know, it's, um, makes me wonder. Well, uh, you know, that one was, uh, was inspired by the first issue of Creepy by Jack Davis. Oh, yeah. Because it had sick. like Uncle Creepy reading to these little kids and all these monsters in the background. So that was definitely an homage to, to that issue. Because after you, that, you, every oh. cover I did, uh, Severn did was um, more like famous monsters. Because mm -hmm. it was just like a big monster head of like right. Freddy or Jason. Right. Or Godzilla. <laughs> well, you have Godzilla up there behind you and stuff <laughs> like that. So, um, How fast was Severn? I mean, as a painter or an inker or... A... Like I said, in the 60s, he was doing over 100 pages a month. Well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> at, well, when I was working with them, you could count on a page a day at least. Yeah. You know, and the same with covers, painted covers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as an, uh, you know, I hate to use this word, but as an artiste myself, I would love seeing his covers because, you know, again, pre-digital, he'd send us the originals, mm -hmm. scan them, send them back. But his covers were so mixed medium. He would do, uh, pen and ink, watercolor, uh, what was called electrofilm, which was like this adhesive color mm -hmm. tape that you would apply and cut around. And so he would just use whatever was sitting around to create <laughs> the covers. And it was a marvel to look at and go like, that takes some thinking, you know? Now, did you ever miss a deadline the time you were there? Well, there was one time. Well, <laughs> or did anything get lost? I mean, if you're doing it to yeah. the mail. Yeah. Well, I was no, you know, surprisingly, nothing got lost, but mm -hmm. I was always tricky because <laughs> as a freelancer myself, mm -hmm. I knew that freelancers are deadbeats. I mean, this doesn't apply <laughs> to John, but every other artist. So I would always skew up the deadlines two weeks. So, like if I said I definitely need it by the fourth. It would be the 18th, you know? Yeah. So uh, under this rule once, John sent a cover and he said, oh, I really hated this cover and I want to redo it. Can I have one day more? And I was like, sure. And we open up the envelope and it was the cover he had done all ripped to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what was on the cover that he did it yeah you know, you know what, and then you know what was on the cover or what was oh to yeah be? it was a tv uh a tv cover where like michael j fox and a lot of other other people are hanging off a cliff oh okay i remember that one yeah, yeah. so we wanted and, to redo uh, that one. okay so he sent this cover all torn up to shreds <laughs> and then the next day we got his redone <laughs> cover wow and like my art director cliff mott who oh he has so much to do with how much fun Cracked was and how great it was and stuff. He, he opened the envelope and he put all the pieces together and I think he still has it. <laughs> <laughs> was it fully painted and everything? It was in color? Too? And like I said, with wow. the set color, wow. everything. everything. <laughs> it must have been a sight if you were there, just, you know, oh, I hate this. <laughs> But oh, that he funny. felt obligated yeah, to the mail it in. That's funny. <laughs> he could have just called you and say, I, I don't it, like it. Can it I redo sucked. it? Yeah. It sucked <laughs> under his opinion. I'm sure it would have been, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fantastic. Now, did he have a preference of painting versus drawing, or did it matter? He just liked doing it all. Well, he, he was a master of all mediums. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was just like whatever the job entailed, you know. I mean, obviously, he was a great pen and ink artist, but he was also fantastic in gouache. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm looking at, again, the stuff behind your head. So you got that uh, Sylvester a la George Washington yeah, doing the right. tic-tac-toe board. You know, and, you know, that's like, that's not pen and ink. That's like full brush. Full oh, of, yeah. You know, oils or something, acrylics or something. I don't know what he painted yeah, it with. Yeah, probably acrylics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and... Uh, you know, that looked like it took some time to do, you know, 
Well, we do it in a right, day. You know? We do it in a day. Because wow. like I said, this would have been the early 60s when he was doing over 100 pages a day, including yeah. covers yeah. and uh, magazine illustrations. Yeah. I, I think the record, and I've been meaning to stick it in when you say how many pages he does, Crack 26, I believe is the issue, yeah. where he did every page except for the subscription ad, which was a reprint from Russ Heath from an older ad or something like that. But he did all 51 other pages, the covers and everything, you know, so yeah, prolific. <laughs> well, you know, a piece I found recently online that I really love, and I think, I think you saw it was, uh, he did some illustrations for uh, one of uh, Sproul's pulp magazines for mm -hmm. William Burroughs, I Am a Junkie. Mm -hmm. Just like <laughs> beautiful detail of a hypodermic and a dot a guy injecting himself with junk while mm -hmm. this girl opens the door and is shocked and everything it's just like i mean gouache if people don't know is basically you know paint in black and white but it was mm -hmm. just like gorgeous mm -hmm. and well that begs the question do you did you used to instruct them what type of medium to use as no. it were you know you no. just said I'd okay. leave it up to him and that's just it. Yeah. Sometimes we'd get a uh, do a shade, you mm -hmm. know, pen and ink with a do a shade tone on it, okay. or he would throw some zip tone on it or do gouache or wash, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I remember I did, I, I wrote a Tarzan parody because, you know, he's got a big connection with Tarzan right. and that and everything. And he did it all in gouache and I was like, Gorgeous. <laughs> now, is he <laughs> is he left handed or right handed? Or? I believe he's right handed. Yeah. Right handed. Okay. Well, Just okay. curious. Yeah. But he is and colorblind. He was colorblind. <laughs> we already discussed that, but I didn't ask what. And uh, yeah, because well, I always ask what handicap, people draw so. with hand, which hand they draw with. And and there are a few out there. Warren Kramer, we mentioned before, he actually could draw with both hands, but he was wow. he was a lefty. And after he had a stroke, he uh, tried to draw with his right, could do it, but he didn't feel comfortable doing it. And so he retired at that point. I ever um, told you the, the Tex Blaisdell story? Not sure. Go ahead. <laughs> you know Tex Blaisdell? I'm not sure. <laughs> he, he was, you know, he'd been in comics for decades and it was, I, I first knew about him as an inker in the 70s at DC, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he also like, ghosted little orphan annie and a bunch of other stuff but like a lot of comic artists he liked to drink <laughs> and like myself <laughs> at bars and stuff like that he liked to balance on one leg of a chair <laughs> okay while doing stuff I've, mm -hmm. I've gotten in so much trouble at bars for just balancing on, on one leg on a chair i don't know why but anyway <laughs> He did this in his studio. Yeah. And I'm sure people listening here will know Tex Blaisdell's name, but regardless. And he taught at like SVA and I think the Kubert School and stuff okay. like that. But, anyways, so he's balancing on one leg, well, probably tippling a little, and fell and broke his drawing hand, his right hand. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So he learned to draw with his left hand. I think Gray Mara told me this story, but uh, he learned to ink with his left hand. But then he was balancing on the chair again with on one leg <laughs> and fell over and broke his left hand. <laughs> I knew where this is going. Yeah. yeah he uh, broke his left hand. Funny. Uh, and then so he drew with he the pin in his teeth. Uh. his teeth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just an amusing anecdote about us alcoholic cartoons <laughs> yes uh now you mentioned john introduced you to the scotch whiskey was it uh bush mills yeah. was he a good drinker was, was could he put it away <laughs> but you know he still yeah, turned in the work i mean he wasn't like right? wally he didn't let it affect him too much, like mm. say Wally Wood or something, right? He, you know? he, he actually told me Wally called him the day before about finding a gun. Mm. Couldn't mm. help him. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, uh, with John, we uh, before the uh, the party at this New York mega club called the Tunnel, 
which was like the hottest spot in Manhattan in 1980. Uh, we had a dinner at the Cattleman, which was a steakhouse where Jim Warren used to bring all his artists to impress them, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for for dinner when they were in town or whatever. And that's the reason I went there, basically. And it was just next door to where the cracked offices were. So, uh, yeah, we had a big steak, lobster, whatever dinner at the Cattleman. John put down a few Bushmills and I tried to match him. <laughs> we were under the table and he was like, what's beating you? What's, get up, boy. No. <laughs> he was a bear of a man. Actually, that's a, that's a thing. I didn't talk to him. so. How did he sound? What did he speak like? Can you imitate him as a speaking? <sighs> no, I can't imitate him, but like um definitely had, you know, deep uh kind of Orsonian Wells voice, I guess. Yeah, you know, right. he, he probably could have done old time radio pretty easily <laughs> and radio shows. And what are we doing tonight? Tomorrow night, Pinky. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, he, you know, he's barrel chested, so he yeah. just boomed with his yeah. voice and stuff. It was, it was an impressive man on every. So level. he was kind of, you know, the proverbial man's man. I mean, uh, like, there's going to be a documentary. I think it debuts next week. Uh, Ken Burns doing on uh, Hemingway, and you know, they're talking about what a man's man he was and yeah. stuff like that. Well, uh, he, he, he seems to resemblance. Severin kind of fell in that same kind of He's definitely mindset. resemblance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now you left cracked what 1990 was that correct? Roughly around there. Um, yep. Did you stay in touch with Severin after oh, that? Yeah. Okay. So, and what did you well, work did, on? I think he, you worked yeah, on he, it with he, a few times, but what did you do? He did that? a uh, daily newspaper strip for the oh. New York Post for a couple of years celebrity biographics that's right i've seen one of those yeah and uh yeah we did you know a variety of celebrities uh you know what we did was it was based on the date of publication uh you know and and the person's birthday and we would do uh you know it was it was it ran six uh days a week Mm -hmm. so we would do three days for each biography and we did you know politicians celebrities sports figures <laughs> and so i'm thinking i'm thinking as part of the package for our next kickstarter for this uh, new cracked uh you know tv show thing is doing a collection of them that's cool i'd be interested in Hey, I'm gonna be working on this stuff. <laughs> I mean, we um, did everyone from like you know, like Bob Marley, Christopher Reeve. Didn't he do one on himself? Didn't you have him do it himself too? Well, that's a funny story. Oh, okay, <laughs> it was a big secret. I didn't tell him, but I got Russ Heath, a, fr- ah. a, a pal of his, a peer, to draw the Severn biography. Mm. So it was Russ Heath that drew oh, okay, the okay. biography. Okay. And we pr- we did that on his birthday. Cool. All right. Okay. So I wasn't crazy. I said, I thought I'd seen a John Severin one floating around. Okay. Um, did you work on with uh, John anywhere else after that? Marvel. Or Marvel. Yes. And- so Marvel, we-, we did some stuff for like a proposed NBA project that never happened, but he did an awful lot of art for it. And, <clears throat> and also... Most unfortunately, like the Atlas Shrugged project, is that we had licensed uh, an Elvis book for Marvel Music. Oh, yeah. You were doing a bunch of music books. Is, yeah. Is that the yeah, only we, time you got John for Marvel then? Is the music? Yeah, it's not yeah. kind of stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, no, and the MBA stuff too. Oh, okay. But, okay. But uh, yeah, this was a Marvel music project where uh the book was uh split between elvis being dead <laughs> and remembering his life mm-hmm. and uh on the mystery train making stops throughout his life mm-hmm. and that framing sequence was done by gene colon and beautiful pencils and then all the autobiographical stuff was was done by john mm-hmm. 
so you know like first time on it on El, on uh, ed sullivan this that you know whatever mm -hmm. and um come back show all that stuff but the thing is is like we did two issues for my line got canceled hmm. so, so where does that stuff out. exist now is that in the ether or does marvel have it or what i, I supposedly got returned to the artists oh okay so I, someone I, may have it or yeah. family well i later i later cataloged all of gene colin's art for him mm -hmm. and he had some of the pencils so I would imagine maybe John's family still has the Elvis stuff, but uh, oh, it's a shame. It'd be nice to see it somehow someday. Yeah, um, I, might, I might have Xeroxes somewhere in storage, yeah. but uh, yeah, that was like my contract at Marvel was close to the end, and we had a meeting, and they said that they couldn't sell Elvis or Bob Marley, and we had gotten two of the Bob Marley books out. And I was like, dude, you could sell Elvis tampons and make a million dollars. You're telling me you can't sell an Elvis comic? And that's when I didn't renew my contract. Wow. Marvel. Well, I know that uh, Marvel went through this strange period that may have coincided with that, where they just decided never to do any sort of licensed stuff again. They they later rescinded that, but uh, they had stopped Ren and Stimpy and I uh, forgot everything else. And the last thing they put out until they did some Star Trek stuff later, uh, was the Mighty Heroes. They put out one issue of Mighty Heroes. <laughs> and, what? Yeah, exactly. It was like, it was just random. It was like, you know, so there's a, the, I can't I think it was the late 90s or something like that. I don't remember, you know. It's that like, is screwy. <laughs> now, so um, is that like the Krantz? Is that Krantz or who did that? Uh, that was Terry Tunes, so yeah, and and Bakshi. Oh well, Ralph. they had Mighty Mouse, so maybe they yeah, had. But... Yeah, Ralph Bakshi was the in charge of that. Who did Fritz the Cat uh, and Cool World and uh, all those different movies? Like we that. might have talked about this before, but um, did you ever dig up any anything on the the flip sides? Um, no, and I that still was ask prank, people. Right? I still ask people about that, and it's like. Um, the closest I've gotten is like, I think I vaguely remember that, but it's like, I could have sworn, I put it in the book, a crack book at the time. It's like, I could have sworn I saw it on TV because they would do this. I wrote the book. I'm promoting all my books, but so are you. Um, I did the book about to <laughs> total television, which is the underdog Tennessee tuxedo and, uh, commander McBragg, that type of stuff. They did two pilots. Um, one was called The Champion, and the other was called, I can't even think of the name of it. Um, I remember the villain's name is Tortilla Fats. <laughs> 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 um, uh, oh, it was um, the, the Gene Hat Tree instead of Autry. It was Hat Tree. It was the deer. It was, you know, big horns. Anyway. Uh, they did. So that wasn't uh, Prance. It was Total Television. No, so those were Total Television, but those were only pilot films. I found this out. They were pilot films that were made that didn't sell. And uh, what had happened was when years later, after these shows were off the network, they were putting the syndication packages together, and they just threw these cartoons with it, and suddenly they were airing, and so. Um, when I asked the guys at the time about it, they go, "Yeah, that stuff wasn't ever supposed to air." <laughs> was it on? Is it on YouTube anywhere? Yeah, it is now. You know, it's like they're commonly available. They're not on the flip uh, sides. They're not on the, not the flip sides, but I mean, that's what I feel happened with the flip sides. Is Krantz also animated the the Spider Man show? The you know Spider Man, Spider Man that show. And Ray Mars did some great work on that. Um, show. they also were involved with those Marvel superhero ones yes. that were the Kirby ones that barely had any animation that basically looked like a comic panel and they go, go, you know, whatever. You know? And uh they didn't do the Mighty Thor ones, those were done by Paramount, but uh they did most of the other ones and they did some other show I forgot, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um there's well because the flip sides pilot apparently had Sylvester, yes. Crack's mascot. So, 
I could have sworn I I grew up in the Bay San Francisco Bay Area and there's a big station there called who's still around called KTVU Channel Two. They would show all this Spider Man and these Marvel superheroes and everything, and then they'd have this afternoon block of cartoons called Cartoon Town or whatever, and they'd just show random stuff and they'd show Tom and Jerry and they'd show this and that and the other, and then they'd show that one. It would just be like a cartoon they show, and I wasn't paying attention to it, but not flip sides. Well, I think it was that, but I don't remember it being called that. And it's like, you know, unless I'm having Wasn't some there sort a of rock band involved too. Maybe, but you know, it's like it's been so long. It, you know, yeah. had I been consciously trying to pay attention <laughs> to it, because um, I hate to say it, I was not the biggest cracked fan back in the '70s. You know, I, <laughs> I'd buy it, but it was just like what Dan Close said. You know, you bought cracked when you couldn't find mad. You know, it's like you'd wait. You'd try to get your mad fix and there wouldn't be another issue and say, okay, I'll buy cracked again. And then he said, oh, I know why I don't buy cracked. I hate cracked. <laughs> That's the worst stuff. Yeah, that this is was before you were the editor. professional work. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know that, but that was after the fact. And that was when yeah. he, he was talking about 60s and 70s crack. Yeah. Now, I know all the people who love cracked and even love it more than mad. You know, I get it. I get it. And I appreciate I it. I I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate it more now, but at the time, you know, it was a major letdown. And, and I used to think this was like bringing it back to Severin. Why is Severin over here at Cracked? Why isn't he yet mad? You know, I didn't know any of the backstory. I, I told just said, you. Yeah. Well, I know now, but, you know, as a kid, I was like, what's he doing over here? He's their well, only see, good that, artist. The, the, the flip sides is okay. another great example <laughs> of, uh, john's versatility because yeah. like he drew uh, uh the comic in cracked in a total upa style like mm -hmm. a total limited animation style yeah. and and again you mentioned earlier where john did like uh you know like 99 percent of an issue oh, yeah. not one uh, maybe one or two of those stories was in his style Oh, yeah, but every other story was done in a different style. Well, he would yeah. use pseudonyms like Lepore or whatever to do Bigfoot type stuff, and that's it. He would, he would, uh, you know, use a variety of styles and mediums so he could fill a whole book, and you wouldn't yeah. really know it was all one dude unless yeah. you were a geek like us. One I remember as a kid. <laughs> and i even know the issue number is cracked 147 and it should it's similar to the uh, crack cover there where he's painting but it's sylvester and he's painting himself uh, like a paint by number and he's painting himself but it's not signed severin it's signed powers and i remember saying to myself wow this powers guy draws as well as severin <laughs> i didn't know it's john's middle name so whoops <laughs> years later i go well no wonder he drew just like him he right. was him so well anyway. that's like le power was yes. another pseudonym for yeah. his bigfoot yeah means. double o severin you know for because he was a james bond fan and uh or never uh, yeah, he did his. Yeah, he did his name backwards. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, he had a couple other ones. It seemed like he had a Swedish one, and uh, that was his name too. I'd have to look them up. They're all in the book, everybody. Um, <laughs> anyway, so after you lost the Marvel thing, did you stay in contact with him after that, or did you just oh, kind yeah. of drift yeah. off and do other things? And. Nope. Uh, no, did you, been in touch with did you ever try to hire him for other things? I mean, you went on to other projects and things. Yeah, like that well, on. I mean, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, after that, I couldn't afford him, basically. Right, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> on solo projects, every yeah. now and then. Yeah, hey, I'm I mean, asking, you never know. It's like, I scraped and scraped together one more thing. <laughs> I did, yeah, I had him ink a, a cover for a planned project that i penciled that never happened yeah. stuff like that but okay but after and, about oh. uh yeah after about 2005 i guess we we hadn't really worked together but we okay. stayed in touch hmm. okay and um during all the time you worked for him and even before did he ever talk about we were talking about earlier about jack davis getting into time magazine covers and movie posters and record albums did severin have any interest in doing that or did he ever pursue that or did he just like doing the comics 
Uh, not specifically. I don't know where he got his work. I because uh, you know early sixties he was doing a lot of like book illustrations for Random House and you know and stuff like that. I don't know uh, where he found his work. Whether he you know openly solicited to get work or they came to him. Sounds mm -hmm. like they just came to him since he didn't do so, a whole yeah. lot, you know. And I, I'm well, not again, saying again doing a hundred pages a yeah. month. Yeah, but I'm not saying I'm not saying that Davis work. really pursued it. It, it. I mean, Davis just locked into like two things, but yeah. did a lot. I mean, it's amazing how many RCA album covers he did. You know, RCA was like he could have retired on that, never done another right. thing. You know, but anyway. Right. Um, so well, again, again, talking about all the styles that John worked in. Yeah. Those uh, like uh, Random House history books he did were like two color. Mm -hmm. And also like some men's magazine stuff he did in the 50s for okay. Sproul 60s, oh, yeah. which I think <laughs> we're also going to reprint pretty soon. Oh, uh, like man's it, action and all that. Yeah. No, no, wild, no, no, no. Wild like, cat. <laughs> like college humor. Oh, those types. Oh, yeah. Quality. Like and French men's French QTs or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. But he yeah. would do like two color stuff. Yeah. And and that's a talent again that like is lost to the digital world. Whereas mm -hmm. like you could only afford to print two two colors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would do some pretty cool shit and mm -hmm. I said that word again. In black and white sure. with a, right with the <laughs> red plate or blue plate or this yeah. or that and everything. And like, you know, it takes a little thinking to be yes. able to work that way. Yeah. So you said you kept in touch with him. I mean, I and I know crack kind of wound down uh -huh. uh, by 2004. We won't go into it too much, but uh the last real good severance stuff was probably about 2000 before Dick Culpa took over at the end, you know. Did he ever talk about working with uh Silverstone or Andy Simmons or Dick Culpa or anything in those later years? Did you ever ask him about it or did Yeah, you, no, yeah. I never asked him not specifically, but I think uh, he felt good in the fact that my pal Cliff Mott was still art director and associate editor because he pretty much took over the uh, responsibility, I think, of specifically dealing with John yeah. and that, uh, you know, John knew that cliff had his best interests in mind and stuff, yeah. yeah because i i'm always surprised that yeah severin didn't leave when you left you know which he could have you know but you know i wouldn't have wanted him to he man stuck it out you know yeah. very pleasant paycheck yeah. i mean i could see where he you could tell when you look through the issues where he, the defining line where it's like i've had enough you know and then and then it's culpa like uh we said with uh lake and, and with simon you know it's like I'll I'll print any scrap I have, you know, and you get like some <laughs> black and white drawing he did on a napkin or something. And it's well, like, I, I don't want to be yeah. too critical yeah. on the, the cracked editorial after I left, but yeah. I think it was sort of like the seventies again after yeah, I left, yeah. where it was like, I mean, I'll all agree right, with you I'm there. I think he did his best crack work with you, yeah. and maybe in the early days with you know, with, oh with, yeah, uh, Sol Brodsky, you know, way back right. when, you know, it's like you know. So. No, he definitely put his work in in the 50s and 60s. And then, like I said, I think 70s, he was, it was a job. Yeah. And he had to draw Laverne and Shirley and, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And But then I'd like to think that, like, you know, when I was there, I, I gave him fun stuff to do that yeah. inspired him. Well, and then like yeah. I kind of think after I left, it was it was a job again where it was yeah. like, okay, I got to draw Mortal Kombat. Yeah. And, you know, like, yeah, it was like wrestlers and all sorts of stuff. He probably Simpsons? didn't care much about. Like yeah. wasting John on The Simpsons? Yeah. I was like, well, I noticed, yeah, later on, you know, they'd give like Brogan all the cartoony stuff and, you know, and different things like that because they probably figured... Uh, this is kind of beneath John to do, you know. We'll give him the celebrities and stuff, you know. So, but yeah, it is okay. funny. He did it. He did it. But even Mort Drucker did a Simpsons cover once, which is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you wouldn't even know it was Mort Drucker except there's his name. So it's like they, sometimes they just sign really crazy. I things. hope he yeah. got his grandkid kid to draw it. And... <laughs> so, um, 
I got we got the book together and got it out and everything like that. We're talking about if you're cracked, you're happy, volume one and two. Um, and then of course, uh, where can you get that book? Uh, you can get it at Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. I've or, heard of those places. Or at Bear Manor's website, where this is now not just in this flimsy paperback. You can get them in hardback finally. So you say yeah. they're flimsy; they look yeah. pretty thick. <laughs> but this is still a softback. See. <laughs> so what, what? What does the hardcover look like? Is it? Well, it'll, it'll the look same the same. Cover? But just have a harder cover on the cover. <laughs> cardboard I, I have other hard well they're over there i have to go get them you had to combine <laughs> the two books you'd have like a freaking dictionary <laughs> <laughs> anyway um yeah i have a friend Stu showstack who does his own show and he always says oh, another doorstop so it's like i get it we <laughs> <laughs> um so i uh, where, where can we end on this uh, i guess the end of his life do we have to end i know <laughs> it's like <laughs> it can never end okay but unfortunately john did pass away and we'll put uh, you know you said he was born on christmas day where here it says the day after so he was born on boxing day we'll say that but huh? what day of the year was he did he pass away on was in january uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, February, February, but it was Lincoln's birthday. Can you believe that? In 2012, you know, I didn't remember that. I remembered it was 2012, but I didn't until I was looking at again this Wikipedia stuff. Um, <laughs> February, February 12th, you know, wow, you know, but I was bummed out that day because you know I was just kind of hoping. I don't know, you know, it's like he just kept working, you know, and it's like uh, I don't know what. When did you last talk to him? Did you talk to him all the way to the end or, you know? What, 2012, you say? Yeah, yeah. No, it was probably more like 2010. Yeah. But, uh, but I guess maybe later I've been in touch because he, I think his last work was um, for a newspaper smoke signals. Hmm. Do you see that? I've heard of it. I don't think I saw it. Because he did like a, a, a watercolor cover of uh, a bunch of Indians burning copies of Cracked. Ah, no idea. So I didn't see that one. Okay. Because like I said, the last thing I saw was the Batlash book, which I have. Yeah. You know. No, and, and I think that was like right minutes before he died, basically. And I guess. Well, I yeah, the one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Because yeah. he did a few projects between that one and what I'm talking about, because he kept working for all I know. Now, yeah. Oh, I, I, I never talked to the family again, you know, because right. I don't know. I just don't always keep in contact with it. But did you ever talk to Michalina later on? I know she's oh, since sure, passed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, if if he hadn't died at the drawing board, it would have been, you know, a couple minutes or hours before he was at the board after yeah. rather right well he made it to 90 years i mean this would be his god bless him yeah so it's like he lived a long full life um was he a he smoker was he, i mean I he can, said he I drank can't He's, say enough did he smoke cigarettes and stuff or do you know i think he quit yeah okay. i mean as okay. as, a, as come on as an american male i I'm yeah well that's like i figured but you know till the 60s <laughs> or 70s well, at least yeah, or even Otherwise, at that 30th birthday, was he smoking a pipe heat. or something? <laughs> yeah. Oh, did, yeah, yeah. I think he did have pipes. And okay, that's why it's kind I of I think hard. if you look at some yeah. of his, um, his uh, you know, self-drawings, you'll see, like, his uh, rondelet with the brushes and pens and ink bottles. You'll see a pipe or something. Oh, yeah. And I remember now the cigarette pack that's on the cover. I think it's the one where sylvester gets shrunk really small and there's like a, a help letter or something and there's a pack of cigarettes or something next to it so, <laughs> yeah so okay yeah well yeah we have to cover seven here warts and all <laughs> yeah. um during your time talking to him and everything did uh he talk about marie much did they get along i think you did one piece with both of them didn't you during your time at cracked wasn't it like a I had her uh, do a few pieces that she penciled and inked, but uh, before before I was there, uh, they did a few jobs that she penciled and he inked. Yeah, like, I know they did uh, a Batman one. 
but it wasn't yours. It was way back in the yeah, six, Batman 60s. versus Green Horn B or something. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and there was another Batman one too with uh, something about the bat signal that I yeah. bet George Gladder wrote. Yeah. <laughs> did he get along uh with like everybody else like you know george and stuff like that or did he yeah. Ever, like, yeah okay so he was he very much got along with most everybody just maybe not feldstein and severin i mean and Kurtzman <laughs> so much okay maybe he just no, didn't like no, editors I mean, he, uh, <laughs> george, george gladder you know uh, some people might not know was a prolific writer for archie and cracked and created yeah. sabrina the teenage witch among other things right but like george was so unique in that <clears throat> he was a wannabe cartoonist that would always do layouts mm -hmm. for all the artists that cracked and archie yeah. and 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 provide reference up the wazoo for whatever he was write, writing and drawing about and stuff. So, mm -hmm. like I said, John loved that. I mean, you know, like I said, as opposed to Kurtzman, I think maybe Kurtzman wanted to follow his every line. Because I, I think that was the problem with Russ Heath yeah. at MAD, yeah. is that he didn't follow the Plastic Sam parody, like line per line. So he never worked at Matt again. Right. And so I think, you know, uh, Kurtzman might have been dictator, yeah. tortorial about all that. But uh, but as far as with Gladder and John, he loved the layouts. Yeah. And, and uh, I've seen so much original art from uh, Archie and Cracked in the past where I go like, Glader wrote it. Because yeah. <laughs> you can tell by the layouts, you yeah. know. Yeah. Glader did it. Yeah, that's cool. and um now he did meet so, him. Yeah, and he was cool. So guy. yeah, they, they <laughs> had a great collaboration, I think, John and, and George. And mm -hmm. uh yeah. Fact, I can't say enough uh, about George. George, George wanted me to, to work on his autobiography before he passed away. If you only know? you had and, and I tried, I tried. We were, you know, it was just we ran out of time and it's like yeah. it just kind of fell apart after that so well i, I mean i, I guess i could still do one was, but it's really but i think what? he was in his 90s yeah he and, got into his 90s also and he was a yeah. few years older than john so yeah and he was like he was like way into yoga since the 60s <laughs> every time i'd see him at san diego con he'd just be like fit and fim, firm and just like yeah. and um you know, he fought in the Pacific War and mm -hmm. all kinds of he was just an incredible individual. Mm -hmm. He started out as a cartoonist and had, you know, some gag drawings in men's magazines and stuff, and then just seemed to uh, you know, get more work writing and drawing layouts and stuff. But mm -hmm. I love George. He he was a great That's guy. Cool. That's cool. All right, I guess we're at the end of this. I mean, what should we do? I mean, are you promote something? I guess. I mean, uh, and what are we doing next on a Kickstarter? You keep alluding to TV <laughs> and you keep alluding to biography and maybe this and maybe that. Um, well, I'm I'm promoting all kinds of crap. Uh, where you see that right over there? Where uh, Libby, Libby the Kid? Morepod.com. Oh wait. I can't I can't tell my left from my right. But yeah, morttodd.com <laughs> under that Billy the Kid cover there on the left. Uh oh, that's my website. Mm. I've got like um all kinds of funny stuff. Severn related. I got the monsters attack, two volumes. Oh yeah, I'll show it again. <laughs> two, right? Two, two, two. <laughs> and actually. <laughs> Here's the you know, here's the other covers he did on the right, back. by John, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, they got a bunch of John stuff plus like Ditko and Gray Morrow and Gene Cole and Alex mm -hmm. Tooth, all kinds of artists. <laughs> and, and then we have the uh, where did my arm go? This no, <laughs> this one. wait, this how do I do that? This one? We got the comedy of John Severin. Makes a great Halloween mask, <laughs> uh, 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 which I worked on with Mark, and 
Yeah, we're going to do my my plan. I haven't really talked this over too much with Mark is to do two volumes of, uh, you know, best TV satire. Ooh, look at that art. (laughs) The best TV satires of the 60s and 70s. It'll be mostly John, but there'll be other phenomenal artists. And then I got like, uh, yeah, you got the Black Bull, <laughs> which is John's earliest work with uh, Bill Elder and uh, Harvey Kurtzman. Mm-hmm. And it's like sort of like a Batman Lone Ranger. And it's pretty fun stuff. And it's from like late 40s that, you know, I remastered the art so it doesn't look all crusty and stuff. <laughs> and then we got the Billy the Kid which is uh we got two issues in color and a collected volume in black and white and they're all shot from the original stats from Mm. charlton so it's like the closest you get to original art it's just not like you know scanned from the comics and all that stuff like (laughs) some people do but um (laughs) sometimes we have no choice right but this stuff is pristine we scan things here. They don't look too yeah. bad. They're still well, I, I had to do a little work on them, laddie. Oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a few Severin related titles out there. And if you like this stuff, mm-hmm. you like all the crap I do. Yes. Because like. So buy his fun. crap and then I'll work with him more. <laughs> and we'll make more crap. <laughs> And yeah, if you're cracked, you're happy. Yay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it was a pleasure having you on the show again and on TV or Zoom. Woo! <laughs> and well, thanks uh, for having me. Thank you very much, Mort. And uh, I'll probably have you again sometime, probably when we get a Kickstarter uh, rolling or something. And maybe hey, we'll yeah. have somebody else come on with us or something if they're helping us out in the project. You never know. So uh but uh we'll wrap it up and end it here and say join us next time on the fun ideas podcast here's to severin yes 100th anniversary 100th birthday of john severin and enjoy his work get anything he did at ec get anything he did at cracked anything at prize anything charlton whatever it's great stuff he's a god bless him (laughs) and his family he's got yes incredible family here i mean i think he had like uh 12 kids and probably has like 87 grand and they all can draw and paint (laughs) anyway (laughs) all right we'll let it go over here all right right. thanks see you next time